building global un uh, networks, unions in the 21st century, uh, online tools that work. And he worked for other organizations and unions in the <laughs> 70s and 80s. He started uh, Labor Start. Well, he did, but he, he uh, published the books in the middle. Yeah. And he wrote another his second book. That wasn't, that wasn't a book. That was actually an article. Um, so I would like to introduce Eric Lee. Very well, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> and I want to start with a, a central irony about the labor movement and globalization today, which is a hundred years ago, trade unions were much more internationalist and much more globalized than they are today. There was, in the first decade of the 20th century, a general strike in Sweden. The trade union members in, in Denmark decided they would each give one full day's pay as a solidarity donation to their comrades in Sweden. This was typical of the kinds of things they would do. Today, could you imagine asking every American worker to give them a full day's pay to support a strike in another country? So if trade union internationalism was doing so well 100 years ago, what happened? And why aren't unions as internationalist today as they were then? The world is certainly more globalized. You can make a strong case that unions should be much more globalized today than, than they are and that they were. That what happened? And there are many explanations to leap to mind. First of all, the rise of fascism. I mean, fascism arose in, the, in countries where the trade union movement was most powerful and crushed unions completely. Um, fascism destroyed the German trade union movement, and the German trade union movement was the center of the international trade union movement and left. But maybe even more important, was the rise of Stalinism, the rise of the Soviet Union as the totalitarian state. Because one effect, the immediate effect of that was the labor movement split worldwide into two camps, the pro-Soviet camp and the anti-Soviet camp, the free trade unions and the communist dominated trade unions. Now the notion that trade unions need to be somehow as international as their employers and to combat their employers or bargain with their employers on a level play field at the same level um, that notion is not that new, even in our time. I mean, in the 1970s, there was a, a Canadian trade unionist named Charles Levinson, Chip Levinson to those in New who uh, worked in the International Chemical Workers Federation. And he came up with the idea that, oh, we should probably organize global unions to compete at global level with our employers. He writes about how multinational corporations dominate the global economy and how as national unions we can't compete. It's all stuff we say today, but he wrote this in 1972, 1970. Levinson was very far ahead of his time, but he was in a position of power. He was not just a writer with an idea. He was general secretary of a global union federation, was now called the Global Union Federation. So he could implement his ideas. And central to his implementation was, well, why don't we begin forming global unions? Why don't we form, for example, company councils? We take a company that we know operates globally, General Motors, Ford, whatever, and we form a global council of workers, and they meet regularly, and we negotiate globally and we begin to create global collective bargaining agreements and so on. This was Levinson's idea, this is what he tried to implement. And the first thing they discovered was, if you convene an international meeting of workers who work for Ford, it costs a fortune. Not only the cost of flying everyone to over work a certain location, but the cost of translating the meeting. Because unlike an international meeting of Ford managers, which would be conducted in English, the International Media of Ford Trade Unions will be conducted in half a dozen languages. I'll come back to the language issue later on, but the costs of maintaining company councils in the 1970s were prohibitive. There was simply no hope whatsoever for the unions by 1990. That was pretty clear. Um, and wouldn't it have been nice at that time, useful to us, if we could have had emerged at that moment in history a means of communication that was instantaneous, global, and free. That would have solved the problem. Uh, and curiously enough, you know, at that moment, exactly at that moment in history, when unions had faced the reality that they could not form global unions, out of nowhere emerges the internet. Unions, by the mid-1990s, were already creating websites. The first major union website that I know of was in Britain. It belonged to Unison, which is the largest public sector union. All the major unions had websites by the end of the 20th century. And the websites that they created by 2000 were almost without exception, uh, to use a technical term, crap. 
<laughs> they were awful websites. They were what we now call online brochures. I was brought into Britain in 1998 and asked to work with a union uh, then called MSF. It was the big white collar union of academics and you know, educated workers. And their website, they showed with great pride their website. Their website opened, you type in their, their address and you get this absolutely massive, it would fill your screen, you could scroll left, right, up and down, full color photograph of the general secretary. Um, a very handsome man, well dressed. And it, you'd, you'd have to click on the photo to enter the website. And then you would, the first thing you'd see is a full page welcome message to the website from the general secretary with a smaller version of his picture, which you could print out if you wanted to. <laughs> I mean, these websites were god-awful websites. Labor Start was founded at this moment in the trade union movement, when a typical trade union website, I'm not sure the other experiences are much better than this, largely consisted of these idiotic uh, photos of the leadership of the union talking about how wonderful we are and welcome to our new experimental tool called the web which we think might be useful someday. I did this and I gave, created a user ID for myself and my secret password and began entering stories and you know, days later it dawned on me, I can probably create a second user ID, can't I, a second password. Like it didn't even think that this could actually be used as a way for many people to collectively add the information. And then I wrote to the dozen or so people all over the world who have been regularly feeding me stories by email and said, congratulations, you're a labor stuff volunteer correspondent. Here's your user ID and password. Extraordinarily, they all bought it. Uh, unions have been doing online campaigns for, since the early 90s. Um, labor thought when it began, on the first day we had it, we had a list of like, online union campaigns. You could click and visit a union website and help out their campaigns. <coughs> But it became clear after a while that unions were not doing a very good job of this. Most of them weren't. Most of them weren't campaigning at all online. Most still don't campaign online. And we thought we would help. Because, you know, we, I could write a little bit of code and we could create a simple campaigning mechanism. This very specific case was not like a global edition of Hilton. The local city of Hilton was closing for 18 months for refurbishment. And the manager, Mr. Oded Lifshitz, I never forgot his name, Mr. Lifshitz announced to the workers, you're all sacked. And when we reopen the hotel in 18 months, we may rehire some of you, or not, and certainly not based on seniority, we might hire the old geezers, we can hire the old people. We won't help you with um, retraining or finding other work, and your severance pay will be under the laws of New South Wales, and because you work in the tourism sector, they're going to be lower than you thought. So goodbye. And when the worker said, well, can you talk to our union about this? Mr. Lifshitz said, this is not a union matter, closing the hotel. We're not negotiating with you. That's when my friend in Australia told his general secretary, we have this tool called labor stock, maybe we can use it. Maybe we can flood this manager with protest messages from all over the world and convince him to change his mind. So we did. And because of the time difference with Australia, we launched our campaign. We told everybody, let's flood this hotel manager. Let's tell them this is unfair. Be nice to your workers. And he comes into work on a Monday morning. We launched the campaign like on a Friday. <laughs> Opens up his you know, Outlook Express. This is probably... 2002, 2003, you know, the good old days. Open that little express, and it's, it's pinging, yelling, he's got new mail, and all of his mail, all of it, is the same message from different people. Um, he may have in the middle of this, like, reservations, complaints, important things, he has to sift through. And you're probably thinking, why didn't he just you use his spam filter or something? He's a hotel manager. He's not an IT guy. He has no idea to do this, right? He, he tells his, uh, his secretary, you know, I, this, my inbox is filling up with all this stuff. I don't know how to stop it. And she was a union member, so she didn't know how to help him. <laughs> <laughs> she was passing on the news to the union all the time. We were getting the stories. It was wonderful. <laughs> 24 hours after we launched the campaign, Mr. Lifshitz told the secretary to ring up the union and say we'd like to, you know, open negotiations about this on the condition that they stop the harassment. <laughs> <laughs> they want a complete victory. And the General Secretary of the Union wrote to me uh, an actual letter, this was the good old days, to the Post, thanking, and saying that not only did we win this great victory for the Sydney Hilton workers, when we organize hotel workers anywhere in Australia now, we tell this story. We tell them, we can push a button and mobilize thousands of people around the world <laughs> to drive your general manager crazy. Um, and it worked very well.